You know, it's so important. <laughs> God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life, right? And you know, I guess what I'd like to do is I would like to just uh, go to Mark chapter 11 with our, 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 our time together this morning. Uh, all four of the Gospels record this triumphal entry. And they all, everyone in my Bible, they all call it the triumphal entry. Yeah. And you know, uh, and, and as, uh, uh, as we look at chapter 11 in Mark, I just want to look at the first couple of verses here. And then we're going to look into what Palm Sunday is all about. Okay? As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one was ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. Shall we pray as we go to this this morning? Father, we just thank you that, Lord, that we can gather here this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather around your word. We thank you, Lord, that as we read your word this morning, Father, we can express our thanksgiving. We can express, Lord Jesus, our hope, the joy that you have given us. And, Lord, I just pray that, by your Holy Spirit, that you, O Lord Jesus, make this a special time in our heart today. And Lord, we want to thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, what I'd like to do this morning is we look at that word Palm Sunday, all right? And on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. And you know, I guess one of the things that kind of really brought my attention to it and thinking about this is, you know, uh, as we look and see what they were required to do, where they were required to be, <laughs> we can kind of uh, relate somewhat, amen, with this virus that's going around. We're kind of <laughs> secluded, right? Or supposed to be, amen. All right, but notice the people left their houses and lived in, and I call it tents, but the Bible calls it booths. And we find that those booths were made out of branches, leafy palm branches and poplars. Mm -hmm. And they were to live in these booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths so your descendants will know that I had them live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. And I'd like to go back to Exodus chapter 13, and we're going to take a, a little look at, beginning in the sixth verse right here. I think it's kind of interesting. For seven days they ate bread and made without yeast. And on the seventh day held a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days, nothing with yeast in it, is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere around your borders. Anybody got that kind of bread today? On the that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time, year after year. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised an oath to you and your forefathers, you are to give over to the Lord the offspring of your womb, your first offspring of your womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every four firstborn among your sons. You know, uh, we've often, our attention kind of goes to that little donkey, doesn't it? 
And you know, I guess as I look back and I think about the lamb, they had to pick a lamb. And as you go through the sacrifices of the, that they brought to the Lord, it had to be a perfect lamb. A lamb that was, you might say, it wasn't decrippled or anything wrong with it. And you know, I guess what comes to my mind is Londa, our youngest daughter, she had lambs. <laughs> and you know, she had one lamb that was so special. She'd go walk down to the mailbox a mile away, get the mail, and that lamb would be right there with her. Wherever she was outside, that lamb was with her. And when she took it to the 4-H show and showed it, it did well. But then the sale. And you know, after the sale, and we were getting ready to go home, we couldn't find Londa. So I went back to the pen where the lamb was, and there she was, with her arms around that lamb. I have to say, Londa and Daddy were both crying. <laughs> and you know, you take and think about if that lamb belonged to a little boy, but now there's a little donkey colt. And Daddy says, you know, we have to kill the lamb to save the colt. You know, what makes me think about this part is, you know, God gave us the Lamb for our salvation. And for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him, and you know when it says whosoever, that meant everybody. Right? Everybody. Would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting. And you know, that little donkey, Jesus knew where that donkey was. Evidently, the people that had led him out and tied him up to the doorpost loved that donkey too. And yet, you know, when they came to get the donkey, they told him Jesus needed the donkey. They said, take him. <laughs> Praise God. You know, it's kind of taking the, you might say, the emphasis off the lamb. But you know, whoever cries out to God, guess what? God receives God's Son. Amen? Just by inviting them into their heart. God is so good, isn't he? Amen. What I'd like to do is I'd like to turn back to the 12th chapter of Exodus this morning, and I hope you don't mind, but we might be doing kind of a little bit of a Bible study, but I think that sometimes we're not all so aware of what things were like back then, yeah. and what was going on now even as they were going up there, and the 12th chapter talks about the Passover, and we, 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 we read in the 12th chapter of Exodus, and we could drop down here a ways, but I, I think we'll just begin with the 12th verse, if you don't mind, this morning. The Lord, or the 12th chapter, if you don't mind. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. <clears throat> having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount <clears throat> of lamb needed in accordance with each person will eat. eat. With what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be a year old males without defect. They may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then... They are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire 
along with the bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And then it goes on to tell us what the <clears throat> Passover <clears throat> really means. On the same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. <clears throat> that is all you may do. Um, kind of interesting when I read that, isn't it? And you see, they were to do this. And you know, this is what was going on as we go into the New Testament and we look at Mark. 11 or Matthew, whichever one we go to, doesn't matter. We find that this is what they were doing. The Passover, it celebrated the passing over of the Hebrew houses by the destroying angel because of the blood of the lamb that had been put on the doorpost and the frames of the houses. Christ's crucifixion occurred on the day of preparation of the Passover week. He is our Passover lamb. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. He was the lamb that was sacrificed for us. I think it's um, pretty awesome when you think about the lamb that they killed to put the blood on the doorpost. And you see that angel that was going across representing God, would pass over the house with the blood on it. Amen? But every house that didn't have the blood over the doorpost. And who were the ones that didn't have the blood over the doorpost? It was the Egyptians, right? You know, how many know that that application is the doorpost of each one of our lives? Amen? You know, when we ask Christ to come into our heart and to forgive us of our sin, it's because He paid for our sin. Amen. And when we pray that prayer, we're applying the blood to our doorpost. Amen? Amen. And you know, that's why Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That night, if you were not applying the blood of the Lamb to the doorpost, you suffered death your family. Amen? Amen? And you know, you, you think about that, and that is amazing. A lamb in its place. And this morning, I guess I would like to make an application there. We find that that lamb died in regards to the Passover, or to this time that we're looking at, as far as the triumphal entry. And you see, Jesus died before that Sunday. You see, isn't it amazing how God brought in all of this? <laughs> what they did to the donkey was also something to show that he would be riding that donkey. That donkey had belonged to God. Amen? <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it amazing when you see that part? And then you see that Jesus became the lamb for us. 
it, it is so amazing. And you know, when I look at Romans 3.23, I says, it says, For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need to be what? Redeemed. Amen. For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you know, God found the Lamb. It was His Lamb. That little boy or that little girl that maybe had that lamb way back then. The Lord was, you might say, experiencing what that little boy or that little girl might have. Amen. They gave that lamb. Wow. In 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, do we have that one? Yeah. 1 Peter 10, 12 through I just kind of like to share it because, you know, when you think about what God gave that we might be where we are today, celebrating this time, all right? Notice, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories, the world, the, the glories that would follow, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things they have now, have been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Isn't that amazing? Even angels long to look. You know, this morning, when you are sharing Christ, you're bringing the message that little donkey was bringing into Jerusalem. Right? And you know, that message that we can bring of salvation, <laughs> even the angels long to look. Isn't it awesome? what God has called us to do. I'm sure that little donkey never realized what was going on. <laughs> but this little donkey had never been ridden. <laughs> but wow, what a deal. Angels desire to look. What did Jesus do? He identified with man that man could identify with God. Now I'd like to go to Revelation chapter 5 and we will look in Revelation chapter 5. Five. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. You know, if you want to do some study, you'll realize that the seven seals and that whole deal has a lot of meaning. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break See it, the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. Then I saw what? A lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Even the Swedes get in. <laughs> I'm teasing. <Swedish. laughs> I'm a Norwegian. I'm just teasing. Okay. You have made them to be a kingdom and a priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Wow. 
Isn't that awesome? Whoa. So awesome. Notice, he must still call the Lamb. <laughs> the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. In Mark 11 and verse 2, that colt was redeemed. That colt had been redeemed by the Lamb. But you know, I want you to know, he was still tied. You know, I was thinking about that the other day, and I'd like to put up Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Notice, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you know, as we look at this, don't we see the world in there? We're still blind. We're all of those things. In Proverbs 5.22, it says, His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. You might say, what you love affects your heart. The very soul of man. Sin has roots that go deep into the very heart of man and shape and control him. In our men's Bible study yesterday, we began to talk about that. How many things in our life will shape and control us. Amen? Especially in this world. We let those things. And notice what it says. Untie him and bring him here. We become tied to our passion, the things of the world, it says, untie him and bring him here. You know, it doesn't say who those two men were that went to find that donkey, right? But you know, God is still calling you. He's still calling you to go and untie that one. One of the things I noticed in my Bible, one of them said, on the other side, town on the other side. Sometimes God calls us to the other side. Lord, I don't know those people on the other side. <laughs> I don't know how to identify with them, Lord. I don't want to go there. How many know that little donkey, when people were doing all that stuff on the road in front of him, he didn't really want to go over all that stuff either. Stuff he had never seen. You know, in Luke 21, beginning with 30, verse 34, Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live in the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch. Pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Amen. Wow. And you know, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, your redemption draw up not. Amen. What are one of the things that we see? One of the things was to see Israel become, and Jerusalem become where his people are. Amen? But when that was surrounded by armies, look up. We don't know the day or hour when Christ is coming back. But we know that he says, look up. It may be soon. Amen? And you know, I think about that one. Someone came to untie. Jesus came to set the captive free. And I believe Jesus is saying, so send I you. And I would like for us, if you, if you put up Romans 10, like to look at verses 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? 
And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Wow, isn't that awesome? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. In Mark chapter 16, we find verses 15 and 16. Mark what? Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. No. Nope. Don't have that one? No. Nope. Okay. It's in, I can get it. Okay. <laughs> we kind of just mixed up, messed up on that one, or I didn't write it down, maybe. Hang on. Okay. Mark 16, what? Yeah, 15 and 16. 15 and 16? Yeah. Mark 16, 15, 16? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And here we find, in my, the, the top of that verse, it says, go and preach. And I guess I, I'm more comfortable with go and share. But, <laughs> all right. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Wow. Some pretty style language, isn't it? In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, we won't need to turn there, but, you know, there we find that Jesus is saying we are to go into all the world. And even in the last days, he will not leave us or forsake us. He is with us Amen. through all of this. Amen. And, you know, we're not having to go alone. And you know, as Jesus said, go into the village opposite you, and there they'll find the colt. And you know, Jesus needs you. He needs us. And um, anyway, do you have Mark 11.3? 11.3? Yeah. Or Romans 10, 14 and 15? <laughs> That's all right. Romans 10, 14, and 15. You got that? I got that. Okay. Let's put that one up. All right. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And we just brought that one up. So yeah. anyway, that one's already there. Okay. <laughs> anyway, let me get back on, on my deal here. All right. You know... Um, We might, we might kind of look at this and stop and think, Jesus used a donkey. Why? Because he was redeemed. Amen? And you know, when you think about what, I mean, that he was redeemed, how many know that he purchased you? He purchased the whole world. But you know, he's given us a what? A choice. Whether we follow him or not. Amen? And you know over in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king is co comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You know, I wanted us to, to see that because notice how it was already prophesied that he would be riding a colt on a donkey. And you know, when they saw this, what did they get excited about? The king is coming. The king is here. <laughs> they were so excited and you know, we're, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We're redeemed when Jesus died for you. He purchased you. Do you know what it means to belong to Jesus? Do you know what it means to belong to Jesus? Verse 7, it says, They brought the colt to Jesus. They put their garments upon the colt. And then we can, let me get back to Mark here. I want to look at verse 8 as we look through that part. 
kind of got away from where I was at. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. It's kind of, gets kind of exciting when you read this part. They threw their cloaks over the donkey. He sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. You know, they knew it was already prophesied that he would come riding a colt, right? You know, they put their garments upon the colt. They welcomed. They accorded a king. Man's garments were assumed to be endued with his personality and represented the man himself. In placing them under Jehu, back in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13, indicated submission to his authority in the same way there excuse me the same way we're acknowledging the royal authority of Jesus he sat upon it a colt who had never been ridden Jesus gets into the saddle have you allowed Jesus into the saddle of your life what does it mean to have Jesus in the saddle? How many know, number one, he holds the reins, right? You know, it's kind of amazing. When we let the saddle, you might say, when we let him in the saddle, I think of a colt, I think of a horse. And you know, he has to submit to Galen. To let me in the saddle. Amen. How many know that for him to be in the saddle, we need to submit, submit to God the purpose, right? How many know that he has a purpose for all of us? In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10, do you have that one? Ephesians 1? Okay. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What's he done? He's made them all, every spiritual blessing, what, available, right? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. When did he choose us? Before the creation of the world. Isn't that amazing? In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in order to concordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Wow. When we look at the things on earth today, we might be living in the very time that God's going to bring unity. Whoa. We can pray. Amen. You know, I guess the way I look at that is God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for every person. His goal for us to live in accordance with His will and to allow him to fulfill his plan in us. You know, when you think about that, 
Do you realize that God's going to do it through his people? He's going to do it through you. He's going to do it through us as we allow him in the saddle. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I think we can pray, begin to pray for our government and our president. Just let Jesus in the saddle. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Jesus said unto Jerusalem, You know, the donkey says, where are we going? But Jesus said, we're going to Jerusalem. The donkey, I'm sure, said what I said. Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> How many have told God, I can't do that? When God was calling Rodell and I into ministry, for about three years, I told God, I can't do that. And you know what? What was I thinking? That I was going to have to do it in my own ability. And you know what? God calls us to things that are beyond our ability. That's His call. And He calls people that don't have that ability so that they know that God is doing it through them. And they need to submit to that. And here we find this donkey. I'm sure He said... You know, after where are we going? I'm sure he said, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm scared. I mean, here's a colt that hasn't even been rode before, and now he's not even in a round corral. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> but you know, when we, when, but whenever we start for Jesus, we have the ability to overcome. And you know, I believe that donkey started picking him up and putting him down. Over the stuff and noise he had never seen or heard, we are going to the city of the king. Let me, Jesus said, into the saddle of your life. Jesus holds the reins, but praise God, Jesus knows the way. Thank you, Lord. We accompany him, we accompany him into the heavenly realm, everlasting life. Isn't that awesome? I would like to kind of just share just a little bit before we close on this triumphal entry. And we need to turn to John chapter 12. If, do you have that one? John 12. And I'd just like to look at verses 12 through 16. And I'll, I'll get there too because I, I wrote down a couple of things in here I wanted to share with it. But John chapter 12. <clears throat> and I'd like to look at verses 12 through 16 there. And if we can. Okay. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. You know what that word means? Hosanna means to save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it as it is written. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on that donkey colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. But only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Isn't that amazing? How the disciples began to read it. I thought, wow, that's been all written about him. You know, um, the palm is a figure of righteousness. Uh, the palm... In Psalms 92, do you have Psalms 92, 12 through 15? Okay. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. I'd like to use go through 15, but that's okay. <laughs> we didn't get that one, all right? Okay, it just goes on to kind of bring out and share a little bit about more about the palm tree, but... 
Palm branches are a symbol of victory. The early church used the palm to express the triumph of the Christian over death through resurrection. And on the tombs, the palm is generally accompanied by the monogram of Christ, signifying that every victory of the Christian is due to this divine name and sign. The palm is especially a sign of martyrdom, as this was considered in the light of victory. You know, in Psalms 92, 12, it says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. And then, you know, as we, if we would read more parts, we find that the people were not only doing that, but they were shouting. The kids were shouting. And you know, what did the Pharisees say to Jesus? Go tell them, to shut up, shut up. And what did Jesus say? If they shut up, what will happen? Oh, the rocks would cry out. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? And then when I think about uh, when I think about Romans 10, 15, where it says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How many of you know that we need to give God our mouth, our tongue, our feet, our heart? Amen, right? We need to give it all to Him. You know, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it talks about the generation that is, you might say, close to the coming of Christ. And it says, they overcame him, the devil, right? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, do uh, you have Revelation 7, 9 through 17? Jerry? Yeah. Okay. Well, then we can just read it from there. But I'd like to close with this, because I think it's so awesome. When you think about way back in Genesis, what God did and what the people did and what went on through this whole thing, and then when you come to Revelation chapter 7, it's exciting. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes. And we're holding palm branches in their hand. Isn't that awesome? There's going to be palm branches in heaven. They're holding palm branches. But this is what's interesting too. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power. And strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who came out of the great tribulation. How many know? We'll stop there, but leave, leave it up. If you're still here, in the tribulation. Heaven is only accessible for you when your blood is shed. Today, we go to heaven by God's grace. His blood is shed. You see, you know, today, it's God's bride that he is building. Amen? Right? When you get past the third chapter in Revelation, you don't see the church anymore. But then when you get to this chapter, what does it say? They have come through the tribulation. And you know that during the tribulation, the Antichrist is killing every Christian he can kill. Today it's already happening. Amen? It's already happening. But, notice, are they who came out of the great tribulation, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. Notice, uh, in our study of Revelation, we, all, we, we talked about this part. Notice it talks about them, they will serve God in His temple. But you know, 
when it talks about the bride of Christ, they don't talk about him serving them or serving him. It talks about going with him. And one day Jesus will go back to that Mount of Olives. And when we were at Israel, the guide that we had, when he took us up on the Mount of Olives, he said, you know, they have found a craft that goes all the way through this mountain. And when they looked at it, they found it goes a third of the way around the world. And the Bible says Jesus is going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives and rule and reign, right? And that crack. When Jesus steps his foot on it. Isn't that amazing? It's pretty exciting what God is doing. But Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst, the sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. All you have to do is go through the book of Revelations and you're going to find worldwide things like that happening today. Sickness going all the way around the world, people dying from it. But you know, during the tribulation there's going to be all kinds of things. There's going to be the sun, a whole lot of things going to happen. And if you read it through, you're going to find that you're going to begin to think, wow. <laughs> the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Wow. Can we claim that for today? There's people dying all the way around this world. Moms and dads. Even a pastor over here in California died the day before yesterday. Fifty people in his church had this virus, right? So that's what the news says anyway. So you know what I believe? I really believe that today is the day of harvest. There's, today is the day that people can reach out and accept Christ. And you know, it doesn't matter whether they're here in church or in their house or their home or wherever they are. Christ is there. He's available. You know, those that may be listening or watching, I say to you, ask Christ to come into your life. Seek Him. The Bible says as we repent of our sins, He wipes them all away. And he washes us clean. And then He enters into our life. And He changes everything for us. Amen. And through us. And you know, one day we're going to stand before God. One day we're going to stand before the judge. And we're going to be judged on what we did with God's gift. It's not so much what we do in this world. But it's about the gift that God has given you. And you know, we never know that gift until we let him get in the saddle of our life. Amen. And then when we get in... Let him get in the saddle. Guess what? <laughs> he guides us. Praise his name. We recognize that gift. And you know, the donkey, the gift was him. was to go over all this noise, go over all this stuff, <laughs> and go into the gates of Jerusalem. And you know, praise God. <laughs> it's exciting when Jesus is in the saddle. Amen. Shall we close this morning? Shall we stand together as we close our time together today? And Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, as we go into this week, Father, we find that there are verses that apply for every day. And Lord, you've given them to us. And we have them here, Lord, to share. And Lord, we also know that, Father, praise God. We can look up. We can place this whole thing that's going on in the world in your hand. And Lord Jesus, we know that you can cause all things to bring glory and praise to you. You can cause all things, Lord Jesus, Father, to work out your will. And Father, you do that in our lives too. Sometimes we don't always understand. Sometimes we go through some hard places. But Father, it's those hard places is what builds faith, Lord Jesus. It builds strength. It builds courage. 
And Lord, not that I'm praying for hard places, but Lord, I just want to thank you for what the hard places have done for us. And Lord, help us that we might, Father, Lord, just to be able to, you might say, see our day, see our family. And Lord, each time we can put our day, we can put our family, we can put our future, our purpose in your hand. And Lord, we thank you for it. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.